So let's begin without further ado. Welcome to the Divine Office Introduction. Okay, so everything that will be shared here uh, has been taken from the general instruction of the Liturgy of the Hours and actually what I went through during my Psalms class in the seminary. So in this short time, I propose to share with all of you a summary on what the Divine Office is, why we should pray it, and a word or two on the structure of the office. Because to new to people who have not prayed it before, it can be a bit daunting. Okay? So let us begin with the question. What is the liturgy of the hours? Okay, the divine office is also known as the liturgy of the hours. What exactly is the liturgy of the hours? Now, the very word office or liturgy, right, gives you the impression that hey, there must be some kind of work involved. And therefore, the divine office is actually the public and daily prayer of the church. You know, if I talk about the prayers of the church, we are very used to, to talking about the rosary. It's the first thing that comes to our mind, probably, when I talk to most Catholics, right? The rosary is the first thing that comes to your mind. But actually, did you know that the rosary is a personal devotion? You know, it's not an official uh, liturgy of the church. And when we talk about the liturgy, apart from the Mass, the Divine Office is supplementary to what we experience in the Mass. And together with the Mass and other liturgical rites, these form the official prayers of the Church. And the prayer comes mainly from sacred scripture. When we use the Psalms, it, it is taken from the Old Testament and New Testament canticles, and as well as the Gospel canticles. Now, the Divine Office is, some, is what we call the prayer of Christ. And the reason why we say that it is the prayer of Christ, because he himself prayed these prayers when he was on this earth. Cool, huh? You know, I mean, that's exactly what Christ did. You see, he was a Jew, right? Uh, and in the first century Jew, he was brought up very devoutly. So he would have prayed the Psalms. Joseph and Mary would have taught him the Psalms. In fact, he would have known the Psalms like at the back of his hand. Okay, so... When we pray the divine office, we are actually using the very words that Christ himself would have said when he walked this earth. So look at, take a look at the screen right now. You see, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. Sound familiar? This is very reminiscent to the prayer of Christ at the time of his crucifixion, no? Right? In fact, the first line, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? was a very cry that he cried out. Did you know that it was not just a random cry right, of his heart? What Christ was actually praying at that moment of a deep abandonment was Psalm 22. Okay? So you see, when we pray the divine office, right, we're not just using our words. Right? We are praying the very words of our Lord and Savior himself. And this is very important. Now, the divine office is also known not just the prayer of, as the prayer of Christ, but as the prayer of the church, right? And why do we say that? Because we have an obligation to pray that was given by Christ. You know, Christ gave us an obligation to pray. Um, we understand when we use the word liturgy, right? Liturgy means the work of the people, right? That's why it's our work, right? It's part of the church. And it's also very much an action of the spirit. Throughout the Gospels and the New Testament and even the letters, right, you have many accounts of how Christ told the disciples to pray never ceasingly. Uh, my particular favorites, they are not uh, in, in, uh, on the slides here, are Luke chapter 18, verse 1, and, or 1 Thessalonians, where Jesus commands us to pray continually and not lose heart. Okay? And the divine office is the church's response to that prayer. Right? It's the, the church's response to that call to pray never ceasingly. So when the, the church uses the divine office, when we pray the divine office, right, we are responding to Christ's call to pray never ceasingly and not to lose heart, right? That's why we use the Psalms and Scripture. We continue the prayer of Christ. You know, I like very much that, uh, I think it's one of St. Paul's letters or St. Peter's letters where he says, you know, um, as baptized, right, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Do you remember that? Right? 
as baptized, we share in the very priesthood of Christ. Okay, we offer sacrifice for one another. The priestly role of intercession is fulfilled when we pray the divine office. Okay, so this is extremely important for us to remember. There is a very communal character of prayer because prayer expresses the very essence of the church as community. Okay, all of us all around the world, right, as one Catholic church, we will be praying the exact same words together with each other and with Christ. It is not unlike how, you know, we say the pledge together, right? As Singaporeans, when you were younger, you know, we the citizens of Singapore, or Monsu Sing Chapo Kong Ming, how can say in the four languages, Kami Waragana Nigara Singapura. Huh? Yeah. Since Stevens, we had to learn it in all four languages, you know? That common spirit, that commonality. In the same way, when we pray the divine office together, right? We are praying together in Christ. We are fulfilling the role of a priest. Right, to pray and intercede for one another. Okay? So this is something very important. Now, another thing that I would like to highlight is this. Right? There's a difference between private prayer and communal prayer. Okay? When it comes to private prayer, most of us are very familiar with this. Right? I will go to my room in a quiet place and I pray to God. And usually when that happens, when we pray privately, I bring my needs and my wants and my desires. Right? But in the Catholic Church, uh, did you know that community prayer has a special dignity and place in our tradition? Okay, Jesus himself said it, what? when two or three are gathered in my name, there I will always be. When two or three of you ask for, for my father, what is it? Uh, uh, what do you say? I can't remember the exact words, but he said something like, if two or three ask uh, of the father of the same thing, it will be done for thee. You, know? you see, the communal aspect of prayer is powerful, right? And the beautiful, beautiful thing about the divine office is that it does not lose its communal aspect when it's said in private. Just like how when a priest, right, when he has no congregation, he celebrates mass in that sense by himself, quote unquote. He's not celebrating by himself, right? He's joining himself to all the masses celebrated around the world for the body of Christ, for those who cannot uh, come to church, for those who cannot experience the graces. He prays and he celebrates mass for them. In the same way, when we pray the divine office, we are transcendentally connecting ourselves with the entire body of Christ with Jesus as our head. Okay? So that's the communal character of prayer. Now, who prays the divine office? Okay? Of course, we as church, united with Christ, her head, we pray the divine office together. But this is actualized by the Pope the bishops and ordained clergy and the religious. Because for them, for us, lah, we have a special obligation because our very being, our very nature, right? A nature of a priest, of a religious. Um, your very being is, your life is uh, an offering to the Lord Jesus for the sake of others, right? Which is why for us, do you know that if priests don't pray their divine office, right? It is a mortal sin. Hey, did you know that? If priests don't say their divine office, it is a mortal sin. This is why we call it an office. It's a work. Right? Prayer is not only asking for what you want, but we call prayer work as well, right? When we, especially when we pray and intercede for one another. But most of us sometimes think that, okay, uh, this divine office is only reserved for the priests and uh, the, the religious. But to be completely honest, uh, we lay people, we are actually encouraged to pray the office either with others or with, by ourselves. Uh, it might interest you to know that in fact, the oldest traditions, if you want to actually study the history of the divine office, right? The oldest traditions indicate that this was very much a communal prayer which the early church would pray together. Think about it this way. In the Jewish community, they will pray the Psalms together when they come before a meal. You know, they will sing maybe, I can't remember what Psalm they will sing, but yeah, they will sing a Psalm together uh, and praising God, right? In the same way, those were the very beginnings of the divine office, Right? where a group of people come together to pray with Christ and with each other. And so, you might interest you to know as well that after Vatican II, there was a revision of the, the liturgy of the hours precisely so that the entire faithful may partake of this. In the past, uh, the divine office was only in Latin. So, I mean, even you give me the Latin thing, I also don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't really know what I'm praying. But because of Vatican II, to encourage the laity to reclaim this tradition that's been in our church, right? It is not something new. Huh? We are reclaiming the tradition of the divine office in our lives, right? It was given to us in a vernacular. 
you know, I made it more easily accessible to all of us to pray together with our priests, with our fellow brothers and sisters around the world and with Jesus Christ himself as our head. I remember Monsignor Lau once telling us that uh, maybe for those of us who are old enough to know, a uh, long time ago, maybe in the 1960s or 70s in Singapore, uh, did you know on Sundays, uh, people, families would come to church in the morning for Mass, right? After Mass, they would do their, go for their lunch and things like that. But these families will come back on Sunday evening to the parish for Vespers, for evening prayer together with the priest. When I heard that, I was like, wow. I mean, my first reaction was, oh, how come we don't do that anymore? You know, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Uh, and it's quite interesting to note also that in the general instruction of the Roman Missal, bishops and priests and parish priests or, or priests of the parish, they're encouraged to pray their office with their people. Yeah, it is actually written there. And I think it's something that's good to have. In, in, our, in, our, in our tradition of a church. So, in summary, okay, summary for the first part, uh, not, not yet done, uh, see all the happy faces. <laughs> so, in summary, we are praying together as a church, as Christ's body. We are praying this one same prayer together with all the other members of the church around the world. Okay? We also participate in the prayer of Jesus Christ, the head of the mystical body. In the divine office, we unite ourselves with Christ in his prayer of praise and thanksgiving to the Father. And lastly, we participate in Christ's prayer for the salvation of all mankind. We are praying not just for ourselves and our day, but for all the needs of the whole world. Okay, remember these three points. Very important. If you need an extra, extra boost huh, to why we should pray this, yeah, there, this is your shot. <laughs> So, next part, the liturgy of the hours. Let's talk more about the idea of the hours. Okay? So, we heard, right, that the liturgy of the hours is very much called the work of the people. Okay? And it's actually very highly uh, regarded in the church's tradition of liturgy. Now, the church as the mystical body of Christ and united with Jesus, her head, we offer public worship to God. You know, that is liturgy. And this is a gift of worship that, and it's something beyond ourselves that we enter into rather than we create for ourselves. Right? That's why when we go for Mass, you know, we're not going there to bring our own like ideas and I think this should be done this way, da 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 But we are there to receive. We are entering into something that is so beyond ourselves. Right? The love of God cannot be controlled for your own sake and cannot be manipulated like the way we want it. But we as sons and daughters of God, we go simply to receive what He wishes to give us. Unlike subjective prayer between me, myself and God, this is the divine office. Some is like Mass. We, we go and we receive as well. Okay? So we also encounter and dialogue. We see that element okay, of encounter and dialogue between God and his people. And we actually see that uh, in, in the scriptures and Psalms. Now, I think this is something that I firmly believe that we need to, to ingrain in our, in, our, in our heads as Catholics, you see. Because at the end of the day, to be Catholic is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we cannot have a relationship with someone that we do not know, right? Can you? I mean, I can't. And we cannot have a relationship with someone that we do not communicate with, right? In fact, a breakdown in communication more often than not results in the breakdown of that relationship, right? And so in a similar way, we need to communicate with Christ and he communicates to us through his word. So that's something we need to remember. You know, it is not enough to just sometimes just pray of our own accord, but sometimes we need to listen as well. And yes, not all of us uh, in our lifetimes will be able to be mystics. Huh? Like, wow, Jesus suddenly come to my ear and whisper, hello, Marcus, how are you today? You know? uh, but he has spoken once and for all in his word. John of the Cross says this, you know, St. John of the Cross, one of my favorite saints, he says, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, okay, but he says something like this. Why do we Catholics always tell God that why are you not speaking to me? He has already spoken to us once and for all. And he has said all he needs to say about his love. And it's been written down for us, for our sakes. If only we just take it and read to see what he wants to say to us. 
And so the divine office is a very beautiful way of entering into that dialogue because precisely it is founded on scripture. And, yeah, and I think that's very important. Okay. And so as church, right, the divine office is also a consecration of the day and a sanctification of our hours, right? It is also called the continuation of the liturgy. So the highest point of our Catholic faith is the Mass, the Eucharist, right? Where we celebrate um, uh, the Lord's passion, death, and resurrection, and we receive Him physically into our lives in the intimate holy uh, uh, moment of Holy Communion, right? Um, but last time, uh, they didn't have weekday Masses, you know. Did you know that we, we are very privileged to be able to have weekday Masses? Okay, maybe now COVID a bit harder, right? But in the past, people were only able to come for the Sunday Eucharist. And so how did they live out their faith from Monday to Friday? Precisely through the divine office. As you will see later, the divine office was very much part of the early church, uh, church's day. And they, as they rise up, right, they continue the passion, death, and resurrection. They remember and recall what they have experienced in the liturgy and take it with them through the week. And you don't need a priest to be there to celebrate the liturgy of the hours with you. Right? It's, someone, it's something that you as a lay person can pray on your own. Right? And you are continuing the, the salvific work in your life when you pray the divine office. That liturgy, that work of God continues in your life. Right? Outside of the church's boundary, outside of the Holy Eucharist. Right? And that's, you know, let that sink in for a while. You know, when I heard this, I was like thinking, wow, my goodness me, how come only in the seminary that I find out about this? How come no one teach me last time? You know, but it's a very important thing to, to really savor. And you will see that later on, as I'll explain, the journey where we relive and remember the death and resurrection of Christ happens throughout the day, in the hours. Yeah, and later I'll explain that, okay? So, now, the divine office is also what we call, what I like to personally call the school of prayer. Okay? Uh, why do I say this? You know, when we say, well, why, why do we call it a school? Huh? A school indicates I must go there and learn, you know? Yeah, and it's true. You know, let me ask all of you a question. You know, how often have you heard it said that prayers, right? When you want to pray to God, you just close your eyes and whatever you say to God, you know, that is prayer. How many of us has been taught that? And how many of us... As catechists also, we teach our children that, right? Prayer is whatever you just say to God, okay? Um, that is only half correct. Because what if we do not know what to say? Maybe in our own lives, we've experienced this. We do not have the words. What if we feel sometimes God is silent? I say, 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 then God is silent. Huh? You see, in the Catholic Church, uh, in, uh, we do not believe that prayer is simply just whatever comes from your, from your mouth and you say. Prayer is also, it has to be learned. It has to be taught. There are so quote-unquote rules of prayer and we need to learn the, these things. Uh, what do I mean by this? I, I like to give an anal analogy here. You know how children, how do children learn the language, you know? Are they immediately able to suddenly like speak to us in proper sentences, no, right? Before they can articulate what they actually want and their desires, they first have to learn the language, which is very difficult, right? Recall all the times where you had to struggle to write the alphabet in a certain way. And there's, there's rules, right? Uh, in English language, there's syntax you have to learn. Huh? There is all sorts of uh, grammatical uh, rules that you have to inculcate in your own life. And you have to take the time to learn them. A has to be written this way. Huh? B has to written, be written this way. You actually have to learn it, right? But when you're able to learn the language, suddenly you can express yourself. Your freedom of expression, right, is heightened because you have the rules already and you make use of them to express yourself freely, to express your desires. And children suddenly can talk about what they want. Mommy, I want this. I want you to buy me this game today for Christmas or whatever. They can suddenly articulate it so well, right? Same thing with prayer. Sometimes we are children, we are babies when it comes to prayer. We need to learn the spirit of prayer. We need to learn the words what we can say, right? The heart of prayer. In fact, the disciples themselves told Jesus, Master, teach us how to pray. You see, it is something that they recognized that they needed to learn. Right? And so for us, the divine office is that school of prayer. Right? We learn 
what it means to pray when we put in the discipline to pray the divine office. Okay? So, school of prayer. Now, let me talk about the different hours of the divine office. Okay? So, the divine office is broken up into such, right? We usually have lords in the morning, right? Which is usually about 6.30, 6 a.m., right? And after which we have the mid-morning, noon prayer, and the afternoon prayer, which is called Terce, Sext, and Nun. After that, we have Vespers. It's what we call the evening prayer, right? And we end off the night with Compline, right? The night prayer. And apart from these hours, right? We also have the Office of Readings, where it's a beautiful uh, hour that we do because the Office of Readings, we usually take a longer scripture passage from the Old Testament, right? Or a letter. And the second reading is usually taken from uh, the teaching of the early church fathers, right? Or, or writings of the saints, right? And these are the hours that are usually broken up. And so for, I, I believe that the, uh, the hours of the day help inculcate a discipline of remembering that God is in control of the day and not just Sunday masses, huh? The Lord is not the Lord of your Sunday. The Lord is the Lord of your entire life. And sometimes we don't rem remember that. We have difficulty remembering that. For I know for me when I was younger, God and Jesus Christ is only Sunday, man. Don't talk to me about that <laughs> on other days. Other days I got my schoolwork and all that, that kind of thing. Right? And sometimes you realize that, yeah, we, we tend to forget, right? I How often in the day do I remember that I belong to God or am aware of His presence. You know, this is the God who created us, who loves us, who thirsts for our presence or in our attention, right? And for some of us, sometimes we leave prayer to the end of the day or when we feel like it. But the hours create a rhythm of discipline, a pattern of prayer that can be built into our daily habits, you know? And it, it forces us in a sense to make the time, right? For those of us who are married here, you know that a, a key to a successful marriage or so is you have to make the time. You have to sometimes sacrifice what you want to do, right? And put yourself in situations so that you can make the time. Do we have that same understanding in our relationship with God? The divine office is a powerful tool that helps us with that. And so, of course, we are not expected nah, as, as the laity to say every hour, okay? Uh, can you imagine? A brother Marcus telling me to say all hours, man. Even Brother Marcus don't say all these hours, okay? In the seminary, we pray Lord's morning prayer. One of the afternoon prayers, either mid-morning, noon, or afternoon. We say Vespers. We say complying. When you are in your final year in the seminary, you are already asked to start praying your office of readings. And as a priest... Right, you are obligated to pray lots, one of the midday prayers, vespers, office of readings and complying. Okay, you're obligated. But for us, the beauty of this is we are actually sometimes just called to take up one or two hours, right? So for us, uh, in the Catholic Church, the morning and evening prayers are what we call the hinge hours of the divine office. Because in the morning prayer, right, remember I told you earlier, right, that the divine office is a continuation of the liturgy right, throughout the week. So when we pray morning prayer, you know, as the sun rises, we greet the risen and true son of justice and we recall the Lord's resurrection at morning prayer, which is why if you notice, right, when we pray, the, uh, next time if you're interested, you can have a look at the divine office daily. Uh, you will notice that all the psalms in the morning, right, are psalms of praise, you know, psalms that consecrate the day to God. And as the day ends and, and draws to a close, we, we pray evening prayer to offer our day's work to God. We recall Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his institution of the Eucharist. We thank God for the day and we look forward to the blessings of the next day. So these are what we call the hinge hours and you can see the liturgy unfolding in your day. You are reliving, in that sense, the Lord's mysteries of salvation in your day-to-day -day life. That is very powerful. Okay? And remember, I spoke about how the divine office is uh, answer to the phrase "pray never ceasingly," okay? Because the with the our different hours of the day, you will come to realize that everybody in the world is always praying the divine office. The church never stops praying. So, for example, now in Singapore, let's say seven p.m., we are praying evening prayer, right? But as that is going on, someone else. In maybe I can't remember what country this is. La. I think UK. La. 
Okay, someone else is praying midday. And as someone else is praying midday, someone else is praying the afternoon prayer and so on and so forth. In Australia, the religious and priests or the laity are praying complying, right? And someone in the USA is praying lots. So even as we speak, the church is praying. And every time you partake of the divine office, you are praying with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the body of Christ. Oh, crazy, yeah? I mean, let that sink in, man. I mean, for me, I find it crazy. <laughs> yeah. So you see, the whole world continues praying and we really literally fulfill the promise, right? By saying we pray never ceasingly, okay? And so, uh, so this is just for your information. If any of you would like to take a picture of this, you can, okay? So this is basically an infographic of the different, a little bit of structure of the different prayers. Like as you can see, morning prayer, right? The morning prayer starts off with a, what we call an invitatory psalm where it invites us to begin the day, right? And then we always have a hymn. And after the hymn, we have psalms and canticles followed by a short scripture reading with responsory. And then depending on the different hours, right? Some things are included and some things are omitted. So in morning prayer, we have Benedictus, Zechariah's canticle. Uh, this is the canticle of Zechariah um, taken from the Gospels, right? Then we always have intercessions at the hinge prayers because again, I say we are not praying just for ourselves, but we are praying as one body for the needs of the world. And right after that, uh, we have the Our Father and things like that, okay? So if you can see, mid-morning, mid-day is slightly different. It's shorter. It's a shorter hour. Uh, we do not have the gospel canticle. We do not have the intercessions, right? It is just the Psalms. Uh, night prayer is also different. Uh, we even have uh, the examination of conscience, which we'll be experiencing later, right? We will pray either one to two Psalms, and then we'll end off with a canticle. And we usually end off complying with a hymn to Our Lady, okay? Don't worry. This one, you can take a picture for your easy reference. For us who are just starting to learn about the Divine Office, we're not required to remember this. Huh? So don't worry. Uh, even I myself, uh, it took me some time to pray the Divine Office. Then I got used to, to, to what I was reading <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. So this is how the Divine Office will look like, okay? Usually we have an introduction. Right, someone will lead, or if you're praying by yourself, you oh God, and make the sign of the cross, oh God, come to our aid, and then we will respond, oh Lord, make haste to help us. You see, when you pray by yourself, you're still using the words us, right? Come to our aid, not come to my aid, right? You notice the communal element, right? When we pray our Father, we are praying our Father, we're not praying my Father who art in heaven. You see, it is not just us, right? We are one body of Christ. So usually we will have a hymn. And this is how a psalm will look like. We usually have an antiphon, much, uh, much like your uh, at mass. We have the responsorial psalm, right? This is something like that. Okay, uh, all of the whole people will uh, recite the antiphon, and then we'll pray the psalm together, uh, gently and slowly. Okay, uh, for the hinge hours, it is followed by a short reading taken from scripture. This is where we are invited to, after reading the scripture reading, we hear what the Lord Jesus wishes to say to us. Okay. And of course, the short responsory, we have the gospel canticle, right? And after which we have the intercessions. And you will notice that intercessions are different depending on the day. Okay, every day, there's a different intercession uh, and there's a structure to it. We're not just praying for ourselves, but for the whole people. Okay. And so usually we, are, we end off with a closing prayer and a closing uh, blessing. So don't worry, looks intimidating, right? Ah, I see some faces already scared already. The smile suddenly gone from your face. Just now you were smiling, but now all scared already. Don't worry, okay? Uh, it takes some time to get used to it. Like, like I said, when, you're, when you first learn a language, it is not easy, right? When you first learn the alphabet, you needed to force yourself to write A a certain way. B has to be written a certain way. Same thing. But once you make that hurdle, it will enrich your prayer life because the Psalms give you words that you never thought could express your emotion. Okay, a bit more on that later. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about, uh, say a few words on the use of scripture in the divine office. Okay, the Bible is turned into prayer into in the divine office. As you can see just now, you see the Psalms, you see the scripture readings, right? The antiphons and responsories, they're all drawn from the word of God. So the, when we pray with scripture, they are no longer just our words, but they are the words of the Lord, even one, even the words that Christ once uttered. 
And I already said a few things about having a relationship with God and why it's important uh, to have Scripture. Because again, the Lord speaks to our hearts through the words of Scripture. Okay, And this is a perfect entry point for those of us who may not be used to reading, opening our Bibles and hearing the Lord speak to us. Right, This is a wonderful entry point to be more in touch with the body of Christ, with Christ as our head. Okay? So, praying with the Psalms. Now, I would like to ask you a question. How many of us here, can raise your hands, uh, uh, how many of us here are familiar with praying with the Psalms? Okay, can I have a show of hands? Noah? Okay, maybe one or two. How many of us have found difficulty when we pray the Psalms? Like, eh, I read this like, eh, that match, I don't understand. <laughs> How many of us have difficulty right there? Yeah, I see more hands. Uh, so, when we, now I'm going to talk about uh, and teach, you know, what does it mean to pray the Psalms, okay? So, when it comes to praying the Psalms, I want us to remember two things when we approach the Psalms, okay? The first thing, it is what we find when we come to the Psalms, okay? And secondly, what we bring to the Psalms. Now, what do I mean by this? When we approach the Psalms, when we read the words, when we read the, the different, uh, different Psalms that we encounter, what we find when we come to the Psalms is what was the author's intention? What was the emotions in the Psalms, okay? What strikes us from the words? That is something we think about okay, as we pray. We don't just read uh, blindly, right? We look out for these two things, what we find in the Psalms. And secondarily, when we pray the Psalms at the divine office, it is also about what we bring to the Psalms, which means our experiences from our day-to-day -day life and that of others. Maybe we are shouldering right, our family members' burdens and things like that, okay? And we bring it to the Psalms. And the use of language, like we said, can be a bit difficult. So for example, you look at this Psalm, huh? Wretched, close to death from my youth. I have borne your trials. I am numb. Your fury has swept down upon me. Your terrors have utterly destroyed me. Uh, this is a psalm that we will hear tonight in our compline. How many of us can relate to this? <laughs> How many of us can really relate to this? You know, what if I don't feel this way now? I don't feel wretched. <laughs> I don't feel numb, you know. But maybe for some of us, we do. For some of us, we are experiencing these things, but we perhaps didn't have the words to express it. And so when we come to find these psalms, right, we are able to identify, and this becomes the prayer of our hearts, you see? And not only that, let's say if you don't feel this way now, right, the beauty of the psalms is precisely this, that even if you don't feel this way, Someone in the world as the body of Christ is feeling this way. I invite you to think about perhaps the medical staff in India or even in our own country who are struggling with this virus. Think of all the family members in India that they have lost due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm pretty sure they feel this way. And so when we pray, even though we may not sometimes feel the same words, we are praying for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? And I think for me personally, this is precisely the beauty of the Psalms. The beauty is in the language that is used in poetry. You see, for the early Jews, right, the reason why the Psalms are used in, uh, by the Jewish people as their prayer, and we as a Catholic church also, the Psalms are so important to us, is this. Because for the early Jews, there is no dichotomy between their emotional experience and God. What do I mean by this? I think personally for me, right, uh, especially for us who, are, who come from Chinese culture or Asian culture for that matter, right, we tend to think that we must, when it, when it comes to prayer, right, we must be good with the Lord, then we can pray. Okay? Only good feelings are associated with God. If I feel good, it means God is with me. But if I feel lousy, uh, where are you, God? <laughs> you know, that kind of feeling. But actually with the, the beautiful thing about the Jews, uh, is that every emotional experience, right, in the human registry of emotions, they actually attribute it to God, you know? So including anger, pain, anguish, jealousy, frustration, 
right? You name it, all these emotions that we don't dare to bring to prayer. We always think that, oh, I cannot feel angry. Uh. I cannot feel angry with God. But the Jewish people never did that. You will find that some, there are psalms of anger and revenge where they want to get revenge on their enemy. But you see, here's the key thing. The difference is this. They will always redirect what they're feeling and offer it to God in prayer. So you will see that in the psalms, especially of those angry psalms, uh, the psalms of anguish, right? They will say they want to take revenge. Oh, but revenge belongs to God. So they pray with every single emotion. That's why we use the psalms. They are not just psalms of praise, joy, but they are also psalms of lament, anger, and pain. All attributed to God, all given to God. And this is a very big contrast to our lives, I, I believe. Because we do not know and we have not learned how to pray when we are feeling down, when we are feeling angry, when we are feeling sad, when we are feeling lonely, when we are feeling lost. Our fellow brothers and sisters have been doing this for centuries. And that's why when we pray the Psalms, it, it teaches us how to do that. I remember this famous story that a priest once told me. Uh, so basically, there was this, there's a hospital, right? And the, the nuns run uh, this hospital. And so one day, the mother superior was walking together with her novitiates, her, her nuns, lah, okay? And they were walking past the grotto. And now, at the grotto, there was a young lady and she was crying profusely. She started to shout. She started to take the stones from the grotto and she started to throw it at the statue of Our Lady. Now the young nuns wanted to go and stop her, right? And say, hey, go and stop this, you know? But the mother superior said, don't let her be because she is praying. You see, prayer is not simply when you feel good. It is about turning to the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of whatever experience you are going through now. Anger and vengeance can, but anger belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Anguish, yes, yeah, sadness, loss, ex express it to God the Father. When we have joy, we also have joy in the Father, in the Lord. You see, we are entering into the experiences of our own very selves and that of the emotions of other people around us, especially in those moments where we do not feel the same way. Okay? That's why I like the Psalms a lot. Now, so then how do we pray? So we pray as a part of the whole mystical body of Christ. We must have this understanding that again, I'm not doing this for myself, but I am entering into the mystical body of Christ. The anguish that I see in the Psalms may not be something that I experience now in my life, but the anguish is definitely felt by others. So for example, here in the example I give, right, we pray together with parts of the church that are experiencing this anguish. Christians in Iraq who are persecuted, right? Our fellow brothers and sisters there, those who are terminally ill, victims of bullying and abuse. Because Christ indeed prays with and for them. Of course, this requires effort and dying to self. It requires us to, in a, in a sense, right, to get out of our own heads and to put ourselves in the perspective of other people. Well, that is precisely what God did. God loved us so much, He came down to be man, to experience everything that mankind goes through. Takes it all upon Himself. Right? Christ has done it first. And so when we pray the divine office, we weep for those who cannot weep. We express joy for those who perhaps cannot express joy. So it's not just about us. In order to enter another's reality, I first sometimes must die to my own. Okay, something for us to remember. In order for us to be really fully aware, you truly say that you are a Christian and you are a follower of Christ. When you pray the divine office, you're not just praying for yourself, you're praying for your fellow brothers and sisters around the world who you may not even know. And the beautiful thing about this is this, huh? for those of us here who are present on Zoom who have never prayed the divine office before, 
Someone in the world has prayed for you. The body of Christ has prayed for you, my dear brothers and sisters. Your priests have prayed for you. Christ has prayed for you. People in other countries, Syria, uh, Australia, fellow Catholics have prayed for you. You see, this is how we are united as one body of Christ. So I think I would say this. La, the, divine, the spirituality of the divine office is this. It is faith that is rooted in God and not in our own situations. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of whatever I'm going through in my life. And we enter into the mystical body of Christ for others rather than expect everyone to enter into you. You know, sometimes that's what happens, right? Instead of us being people, being bread broken for others, we want everybody to be broken for us. <laughs> sometimes you want the whole church to serve us. We want everything to go my way. I want God to give me what I want because I know better, right? And so when you pray the divine office, you see it changes your entire understanding of what prayer actually is. So I would like to come to the final parts of the session today with frequent objections raised when beginning to pray the divine office. Okay, maybe some of these objections are things that you already have in your mind huh? as, I was, as I was speaking. Okay, so firstly, Alamak, brother. Sounds good, huh? but it's so hard, man. I don't know what I'm doing. My answer to you is this. It is meant to be that way. <laughs> it, is it is meant to require effort. That is why it's called a work. If it's so easy, we will take it for granted. Right? We will just say for the sake of saying, it is meant to be, in a sense, challenging. Because it requires us to give something of ourselves, not just our time but our attention, our energy, our effort. And that is how we know we love. You know, we know we are loved when people go the extra mile for us, right? And so when we say we love God, this is how, in a sense, this is how we express it. Lah. You know, where we go an extra mile for him and the church and for our fellow brothers and sisters. Okay? So I'm not going to say it's not, it's not hard. Lah. It, it is hard. Sometimes I do experience that difficulty as well. But that's why it's called a work. Yeah. Secondly, brother, I don't feel connected when I pray. Okay. I really, had, I, so sometimes we experience that, you know, when I pray, you know, somehow the Psalms don't really touch me and all that kind of thing. Uh, that is precisely because um, we need to go through the process and we need to die to ourselves, to put ourselves in the mindset of another person. Right. And in those moments where we don't feel connected, I say, go, keep going. Um, because in a relationship, let me ask you this question. I, I mean, I look back at my relationship with my parents. Do I like take pleasure and bliss at everything that they say? <laughs> I don't. Sometimes I don't understand what they're trying to tell me. But it's only years later uh, then I suddenly happened, something happened to me that I remember. Hey, yeah, my parents said this. Uh, wow, they were right. <laughs> Sometimes in that way, when we pray the scriptures, when we pray the Psalms, it might not make sense to us today. But we still go through the process. Because one day, it might make sense to us. God's message might make sense to us down the road in the future. So that's why I say when the whole plethora of human emotions are on display, it is not always about what you feel. Keep going in spite of what you feel. Okay? And so, where and how can I start praying? So some recommendations, right? Uh, firstly, get the divine office. I, uh, for me personally, right, uh, we may not be very familiar with actually uh, flipping the actual divine office because it can be quite complicated. Even when I entered the seminary, right, you see very thick, uh, and this is not even the full version. Uh, I had some difficulty flipping, 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 and it took me some time. But because the technology is so good, right, uh, and the church is so, so beautiful in that way, right, the divine office is made easily accessible to all of us uh, via, you can go online and find it actually. And they'll even give you the press, exact press of the day, so you don't have to be worried. Uh, you can find the Universalis app, you know, uh, Universalis. I, can, I will send it to you later on, right? Or you can go to catholic.sg, our Catholic Singapore uh, Archdiocese website, right? Uh, and you just type Catholic SG Divine Office. They will give you the actual press of the day and you can choose which hour you want to pray, okay? Secondly, I would say get guidance, right? Uh, if you want to explore it by yourself, start with a, an, an hour, and have someone pray with you, 
you know maybe you can encourage uh, i mean after this session i don't know right uh, you can encourage um, your priests uh, to maybe start something you know especially in case uh, I, I foresee if let's say we enter into circuit breaker right i think it'll be very nice to pray the divine office together as one church community even if it's on zoom i think that'll be very beautiful right yeah and I'll, i and i will gladly pray uh, with everyone if they, if people are interested right so we don't feel that it's that is so daunting in the beginning so for some of us right we may not want to pray all the psalms right we can choose one psalm let's say okay uh, three psalms may be a bit much so you can just choose one psalm of the divine office to pray with us okay and you can start with one of the hours so i remember when i was younger i didn't start and gang ho pray all uh, all the hours uh, no 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 i just started with one uh, which was compline the night prayer and i did compline regularly then after a while i decided to pick up the morning prayer lots and vespers yeah so you can start off with one hour right and then if you would like to continue uh, you can do so if you feel that confidence uh, later on okay so these are some recommendations uh, that i i have lah uh, for all of us and so finally we've come to the closing of the session you know uh, where i will take questions and answers uh, so any of you have any thoughts uh, any questions you can ask and i will leave you all with some additional resources okay if you would like to read more about some question in the chat brother some question in the chat okay so if you would like to read more about the divine office right you can search the general instruction on the liturgy of the hours it is not that hard a document to read uh, but this is only if you have time it will cover certain things that i've talked about in today's talk but it's more in depth lah uh, more theological okay uh, you can find it online uh, i've i've taken the liberty of uh, dropping the link here maybe what i can do during the q and a is i will copy and paste these things into the chat so you can have easy access to it okay uh, secondly uh, you can watch yeah so during the circuit breaker uh, last year uh, some of us seminarians we decided to make a few videos to sort of summarize everything that we, i said in this session uh, so in case any of you want a refresher on what the divine office is and how we should pray it you can go and actually find it on youtube right it's a four part series something easier to swallow you know if not all of us like to read uh, you can find it on youtube i'll send the link to you guys again uh, but or you can go to youtube and search archdiocese of singapore divine office you probably see it uh, come up and and lastly if uh, any of you would like to take up uh, a, a extra reading you can get this book called the school of prayer an introduction to the divine office for all christians this is by john brook is a red book here yeah? okay i'm not sure where do they sell it in bookstores in singapore but i got mine online uh basically it is a little instruction on why we should pray the divine office the, the spiritual fruit of it and also they have commentary on the different psalms that you pray on a weekly basis so you can have a bit more context uh, to why the psalm is wrote in this way you know it help you uh, actually it's very rich you know it will actually help one connect with uh, the psalms a bit better i was thinking that if in the future if we ever start praying the divine office together we can use we can use this as sort of like a lead in before each psalm to give a little explanation it will help us really get in touch with the psalmist and the words that we pray okay so these are the additional resources that I'll leave you. I will uh, copy and paste this in the chat. So I suppose now we can take uh, 